<laughs> so I, you know, uh, I recognize that the last talk of the day, and you've been sitting here all day. No, oh, there's no more. Oh, hours. Hours more. Oh, well, as you get near the end, the challenge is to try and to help kind of sum up a little bit of what what you've seen during the day. And there's some things I want to try and sum up, and that is, you know, I hope when you know, when you go down through your career, you continue to have this excitement for what you do and what you study. And that's, that's just really important. And I think one of the things that you've seen with the people who've been talking today is how excited they are about this. They want to talk to you about this stuff. They want to interact with you. Um, don't be a shy doctoral student and not come up to these senior people and talk to them. You have to do that. Um, but that also is not just they want your research, but um, in, in the way in which you build like the research community. And um, I, I appreciate the, the comments that uh, Jenny made about the service to the NSF. That's a really important work that we have to have good people that go to the NSF that really are interested in building research communities and building interesting topics. It's probably not going to be TMSP, say, 50 years from now. It's going to be something else, right? So research and everything progresses. And we have to think about setting up that. What's the future of those kinds of things? And so contributing to the research community is really important. And the last one is you can tell how excited people are by the number of words spoken per minute so far, right? People speak fast when there's so much they have to tell you because they're excited about this thing. And so, uh, so I was paying attention to the community of, of speaking. Lots of words spoken per minute so far. I, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so another one that I've been thinking about is this, you become what you measure, right? Terror contrives, make it thank yous. And how that starts to relate to things like the, the real world impact. We want to understand and shape or improve the situation. I think, I think just understanding isn't really moving things forward. I do want you to think about taking action with that understanding. And I hope maybe a little of my talk will show you like some ways that you can start doing that. So I'm going to try and deal with a little of that. And then this other piece about you are what you measure. So you know, I started thinking about things that were harder to measure in Wikipedia. And one of our early studies was this stuff of, of barn stars. How many of you have ever heard of barn stars? OK. So they're, they're a certificate of appreciation. Thank you for doing this really valuable work, right? How many of you get certificates of appreciation for you did nothing? <laughs> okay, how many of you get certificates of appreciation when your employer, you know your employer could not care at all? Okay, so there's something about an acknowledgement that's important. Communities acknowledge, somehow acknowledge things that they value. And so in this work, we were trying to understand what are the, what is the range of work that was being valued by Wikipedia. And, and just to kind of fill that out, it's like, there's actually a lot of different work in Wikipedia that's valued. And a lot of this work is very difficult to just simply count. All right? And so, so because actually in Wikipedia, everything is just an edit. All right? And so if you fall back to edit, you made a change to some text, then a lot of this gets lost. So this is the charge to not just think about what are the things that you measure, but try and make those things that matter. All right, and I think that's what Ben was actually saying in the, in the, in the beginning of the day. And so, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of where I think things are heading in this space around TMSB. But what I want to talk a little bit about today is some work that we've been doing. It's ongoing, actually, in this um, a set of design explorations to realize social translucence in Wikipedia. And uh, there were multiple students who worked on that, and I'll acknowledge them in the end. But the longest running collaborator on this is, is Mark Zachary in Human Centered Design Engineering, uh, that department at the University of Washington. And so, just a little bit about what it is I'm going to talk about what the motivation is, to give you a brief definition of social translucence, talk about a reflex system, and I'm going to show you a live demo. And those of you who love live demos should be thinking, I hope it crashes, because there's nothing like a crash during the live demo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what does, the, how does the uh, pre uh, presenter respond? Um, and future directions, and that is, the future directions is actually a bit of work um, that was just recently funded um, about these things called voluntary virtual teams, also kind of characterized as self-managed work teams. I think you're going to start seeing a whole set of connections, and ironically, a lot of connections, yeah. Um, so what's the motivation here? Well, if you think about um, mediated collaboration um, in like online spaces, often that attenuates our ability to understand what the behaviors are. 
It's difficult to interpret and understand what's happening. So the example of that in Wikipedia is that editors um, can interpret every edit. They can sit down and look at every edit that someone else has made. Um, but actually validating and understanding each of those edits is, is a little hard. I mean, just because you can see every edit doesn't mean you've really formed a good interpretation of it. Um, as well, in these systems, of course, as you scale, think of as you move, as Wikipedia gets larger, right? The issue is the absolute numbers of people in these large-scale systems and, and the way in which they collaborate makes it difficult to comprehend um, the massive numbers of interactions. So you've got massive numbers of interactions and people have a hard time keeping all that in their head. It's really hard to interpret. So yes, editors in Wikipedia can actually um, look at every edit, but they really don't have the time to truly inspect the edit and every edit of everyone that's edited with someone else, right? Because it becomes this sort of geometric explosion of the number of people and number of edits you have to look at. So what we might want to do is um, help that understanding, comprehension, and interpretation. That is, we might want to help, we want to build systems that help people who are using those systems be productive. They want, want to form some understanding. So social translucence is a, one of these design ideas um, coined by Erickson and Kellogg in the 1990s. Social translucence has three key design characteristics. An idea of mutual awareness of activities, that you have the contextual propagation of socially sal salient cues. And the way that um, Ke uh, Kellogg and Erickson talk about this is they call it visibility, right? But I, I think you want to think about the, how you propagate these cues. And then the last one is the accountability for your action. So that is that the community or another individual, when they see your action, they see something that you've done, they can, they can interpret it and try and hold you accountable for it. I mean, there might be still some debate about whether it was good or bad. But at least you can be called out for saying, I think you did this, and maybe we should talk about that. All right, so those are some three characteristics. A lot of the uh, way um, social translucence gets then sort of enacted is in these sort of um, pictures. So this, this picture on uh, your left is uh, of like a lecture hall. That there's sort of someone that's kind of like the focal person in the, in the, in the scene. And then there are these other people who are kind of sitting out there. And when someone asks a question, there's some there's some you know activity by the audience. You have know anything like that? You ever? <laughs> is that memorable? Okay. All right. Good. Um, another one might be a chat room, and then you might think of like an online line waiting for help, right? Um, you know, technical support. You are call number four hundred. We will get to you in an hour and a half. And, you, know, Very important. you are so important to us. Yes, exactly. Okay. So we're going to think about translucent design. And maybe some of the questions we want to ask is, so is this idea of translucent, is it really a system? Do we have a translucence as a system of translucence? Or is it more like a, a, like a feature? Is it something that you can, you just, you just have a little bit over here, right? Is it something that you really have to have that you build from sort of from the bottom up. That is, if you don't think about translucence, could you never have it? That is, do you have to do you have to imbue your system with it? I mean, I'm willing to accept that maybe a designer wasn't really thinking about translucence, but wanted some kind of property, wanted someone to see some of someone else's behaviors. And so maybe you could have a system where it wasn't necessarily intended to be social translucence, but they had opened up certain aspects of what you might want to project. So so bottom up, or can you just like slap something on the top and get translucent, right? Um, and then do you just show the raw data, just show like exactly what happens? Or do you somehow compile and distill this data down to make it somewhat a, a kind of interpretable in some way? Because I mean, because raw data is interpretable. You can see that in Wikipedia. People do use those edit blocks. So, so it's, it's not obvious that you have to have some kind of, of distillation. So in asking those questions, what you're really beginning to ask is, so what's the shape and extent of a socially translucent design space? What does that design space look like? What are, what are the things that are in, inside? What's outside? What are some of the useful dimensions? How should we speak about a socially translucent design? What are, what are the, the, the dimensions that I like, might lay things out on? And how can we analyze and understand a socially translucent design? What does it, what does it mean? to have a design that then exhibits some properties of social translucence. Um, and again, that some of those questions up front would have very different implications for this. So we wanted to understand this a little bit more. 
And there really isn't a lot of work on exactly how to do this. There are a fair number of papers that claim that a system has, has used social translucence or illustrates social translucence, but no one had actually set out to decide, well, what is actually the socially translucent design space look like? So what we tried to do was this thing called the domain analysis. How many of you have heard of a domain analysis? One, two, okay. This comes, this, this term comes from software engineering. And it's a way of looking at all of the implementations of something. Like, say, all of the different ways we might implement spreadsheets. And as a software engineer, you analyze that and you figure out, well, there are certain types of data structures you need, certain types of algorithms underlying it, certain ways you present the data, right? And you, you basically kind of articulate all of the different systems and all of these different features, and you start trying to map it out. And so if we were going to do that for social translucence, I would get a great picture of systems. What would I be missing? Users, right? I mean, it's social translucence. It's not technical translucence. So what we tried to do then was push into this idea of a socio-technical domain analysis. We're trying to account for not just what are the systems doing, but how do these systems trying to like interpret or show behaviors for people? What are they trying to do in that space? So yeah, account for both the technical implementation as well as the social environment. And so in our attempt to do this and thinking about where we were heading, we came up with two particular dimensions, and a dimension around action, and then a dimension that is around the levels of system interpretation. What, is, what are the systems trying to show in terms of interpretation? And I'm not going to go through all of these, because um, there's, there's a lot there. But uh, we kind of marked it up into a framework, and um, this, this particular paper, which is Buildings for Social Translucence, Domain Analysis and Prototype System, uh, at CSCW this last year, so February, um, kind of marks out like how did we start thinking about this? What are the spaces? And so, so we kind of have these these two dimensions, and and so yeah, that's thinking about social translucence. But then, what you might want to do is not just have those domains, but you might want to take those domains and try and put those those dimensions and put them into to action. Try and do something with them. And so we push this into two things. One is an idealized architecture that we call REARCH. So an architecture for translucence. It attempts to um, sort of push translucence down into the system. Say, where, what would you have to implement down low in the system to, to be able to do translucence well? And you know, so, so that's one of the things. And then this reflex, which is a visualization and UI platform, which basically tries to say, so if you were going to visualize something like this, how would you sort of illustrate translucence built on top of something like a, a reflex architecture? Uh, reflex and re-arch. So now, I told you initially what the motivations were, um, trying to help people make interpretations of the behavior around them. And one of the things that's fun about being engaged in a research community and working on systems is that you find people who then identify problems, even though we had a problem, but you find people who identify problems and go, that's a good example of what you might want to do. And so it turns out that one of the people here uh, who worked with Brian, who happened to work with Brian Keegan, <laughs> talked a little about this as well. And so this is based on hot off the wiki dynamics, practices, and structures of Wikipedia's coverage of the Toku um, catastrophe at, at Wikisim. And the, the thing that's kind of interesting is what you might want to do, and this is a little bit of what that work does, right? So you might want to try and say, well, are there some kind of editing styles here? Are there, are there, could you look at people and see something about what it is that they're doing and potentially who they're doing it with, right? And so, so that's one of the examples that Reflex does relatively well. So let's see if we can get it to pop up. Uh, oh, that's not very nice. So I'm going to get, maybe I can do something else here. Let's see. Working at NSF is good background for taking risks in your talk. You sort of develop lots of um, risk taking. Yeah, brain, willing to take risks. Here we go. And so, so this is this is a reflex. And what it does is this is a live Wikipedia page. And so we're proxying that page. We inject our code into the page and set up a set of things that then sort of interact with stuff that's on the page and interact with servers that are remote. 
And so the reflex toolbar sits kind of at the top, and we show you two different types of relationships. We'll visualize two different types of relationships, person-to-person -person or editor-to-editor -editor relationships and editor-artifact relationships. We'll let you pick four different contexts from which that, um, that information will be pulled. So Wikipedia has all of these namespaces, and this is just to narrow the complexity of the implementation. We're just going to use four of those namespaces, but we pick four of the most important namespaces. Things that are article, article talk page, user, and user talk page. We'll let you pick a time window. So, so you get to say, do I, you want to show it for like all time? Do you want to show just the last few years? And this is actually kind of useful. Because a lot of systems don't have a good, especially systems that compile lots of data, like, they don't have a good idea of like forgiveness. How do you go, like this early person really kind of messed up, but you know, in the last few years they've been really good at this, they've been a good citizen. So you might want to have a time frame. We'll show you some number of interactions and then we have two different styles of, of visualization. Sort of this kind of very simple egocentric graph and this sunburst kind of graph. Now, this was really, the whole system was really oriented around this idea of looking at, looking at people. And if you know Wikipedia, one of the things that's interesting about Wikipedia is article pages generally don't have anchors of people on them. And this is where faculty should listen to doctoral students. <laughs> and I finally did. <laughs> uh, and that is, the doctoral student would keep coming to this and go, I, I, I don't know what would show anything, right? Because there's no anchors on this page. And so he said, well, let's just l have a part of the toolbar. Let's just list the people who've most edited this page. And so the flooded, good vac, right? These are the, no the people who have most edited this page. And uh, you can see the, the number of edits for that time frame. Um, and uh, that then forms a very simple anchor. So if we're going to look at the articles that this person edits, I'm going to turn off these two. What we can potentially do is hover over flooded and see that person in the middle of the graph and the articles that they edit. And when you start looking at the articles that this person edits, what might you say about this person? Disasters. They kind of like disasters. I am so glad. That's perfect. We're actually trying to test that because once you build a system, you want to evaluate it. And so that I, I have then a, a population that can kind of see that. I'm, I'm hopeful then that maybe some of our evaluation might work out. Okay, so, so yeah, you can, you can look at this and you can... You can <laughs> he does a fair amount of disasters. But then you might also ask for the question of like, okay, so now given that he works on those disaster pages, who does he collaborate with, right? So now we've just seen the disaster pages. Now what we have to do is see who he collaborates with, and this is the Jeopardy. <laughs> okay, I oh, came back. Okay, so now what you can see is the set of people that he most collaborates with, with the shorter distance here in this egocentric graph represents closer tie, all right? That's what we're doing here. And so you can kind of start looking at, well, this person, WWGB, that's a person that he collaborates with a fair amount. Almathea, Guerrero, T.B. Hodge, right? And so, so you can kind of just see who he collaborates with. And if you wanted to chase that down and you said, well, all right, you know, I, it's interesting that he collaborates with this guy. What I might want to see is whether it's kind of a reciprocal relationship. So I hover over this person, and that person becomes the center of the graph, and I can then begin to see, again, Jeopardy. These, these are long-running queries, and so we're using a big, that server at the back to try and make this happen, but it still takes a long time. Technically, this is where the graduate student should be listening to me. And I keep saying, how come we're not caching the result? We do this over and over again. It should get faster. <laughs> um, and so what you can then see is whether WWGB, whether they uh, collaborate with Flooded on these pages. And uh, let's see, is he in the list? No, he's not. So one kind of edits more with the other, but that person, their editing activity is probably on other pages where Flooded doesn't, be, doesn't, doesn't engage. And so you could then also chase that down. So it's a very simple way of starting to understand who collaborates with whom and what kinds of things do they collaborate on. And you can kind of look at that in those contexts. Okay. Let's go back. So... So there is another example. 
And that is the example that we originally started, originally motivated our work, and that is this idea of, of, of selecting admin, admins, new admins for Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is an, is, is an online community where the new administrators of the online community are picked from within the community. And they have this rather rigorous review process. And we did a little bit of work on um, looking at how do admins get selected. When people are reviewing admins, what are some of the features? What are the things that the admin review process looks at? One of the things, of course, that popped up is they want to know um, who do they hang out with? Because people know that if they edit with these other people and those other people are trustworthy and I know those, those trustworthy people because I trust them, then maybe this guy's trustworthy. And so, so they ask a lot of questions about that. And so, um, so we can kind of do the same thing with the RFA pages. And the RFA pages, how many of you actually ever seen an RFA page? No, all right, let me, let me at least just show you one of these so that you'll, you'll have an idea of how one might use a tool like this on pages like that. And yet again, that's disappointing. You got this one best? Yeah. Okay, so an RFA page, basically, basically there's a lot of a lot of sort of header stuff, and then the way an RFA starts is the name of the person, and then a nomination, and the nomination is signed. So Bagumba is being nominated by automatic strikeout, and he says why. And then there's a set of questions that the candidate is expected to reply to. And uh, I think the first five questions are fairly standard. And then, oh, well, three questions are standard. And then you have a set of additional questions that individuals can ask. And many of these questions are specifically about the policies of Wikipedia. And they aren't, set, they aren't in the space of, tell me about policy X. They're, if you see X, and then you see Y, and you see Z, what would you do? And often, X, Y, and Z represent a kind of confounding problem with regard to the policy. So I forget who said, people have not read all of policy. <laughs> Turns out there are a lot of admins who have read an awful lot of the policy, and they really know it very well. And so this is their way of testing it. And then what happens is down after, and look, all of these additional questions, um, then down below that is people who either support the nomination or people who, um, are opposed to the nomination. It turns out that this case, there's no opposes and one neutral. And so what you might do on, on a, a page like this is you might want to inspect who are these people who are actually doing support. So um, I've just seen this user around quite a bit. They're almost always calm, collected, even-handed. I believe they make an excellent admin. All right, so who is this guy? Come on. No. Come on. All right, I'm not sure why. This is the, oops, it broke. Uh, yeah, who knows, it could be some crazy thing with, with what's going on in the page. Is this one even working? The command tab and the command tab back, because commands, you can have the right focus. That's what it's Yeah, all right. You told us to hope that it failed. <laughs> <laughs> then it did, yeah. That's, that's, that's asking We're for the wrong question. Excited. Yeah. So, oh, well, let's see, it half worked and then half broke. It's like, what does that mean, right? I, I got both. Um, so I'll, I'll let you know, I, this is, it, it is actually proxy um, restricted because it's really right now just sort of an in-house tool that we're working with. Um, but I opened it up um, on the wireless here. So if you want to just kind of play with it now, you could go and go to our, our proxy and play with this. So I'll, I'll show you that at the end. So you can... Yeah, well, but, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop demoing right now and finish the talk. <laughs> we started being motivated by uh, this set of work in um, management and organizational behavior. This goes way back to the 1990s. <laughs> that was like last century. <laughs> and uh, there was this uh, idea that, you know, the new form of the organization was everyone was just going to kind of come to the organization and they were going to self-manage. We we're going to have these teams that just, they just form together and it's going to be magic. And so actually a lot of management with literature was kind of interested in this. 
And so there were some good studies and some models. And we, we kind of lifted this model um, about these high-performing teams from Yates and Hyten to say, well, the, even if this model isn't exactly the right model, there are some factors in this model that we might need to account for if we were going to visualize what a group is or what a team is. All right? So this starts to form that sort of empirical part. And, then, and what would you apply this empirical part to if you were a Wikipedia person? Any idea? Turns out that Wikipedia has teams. How many of you know Wikipedia teams? Yeah? Awesome? That's good? Yeah? You're great? Okay, so Wikipedia has these things called Wicca projects. A Wicca project is a group of editors that want to work together as a team to improve Wikipedia. So it's got both. It's not just a group, it's a team. That, that, that's awesome. And that's their definition of Wicca projects. And so, so we're going to leverage it. And there are hundreds of Wikipedia Wicca projects. Right? There's hundreds of them. And, and actually, there are whole bunches of them that are active and successful, and there are whole bunches of them that are not active and have somehow died off. And so you've got this wonderful ecosystem of teams. And another thing that's interesting, but also they can declare membership by behavior. So it turns out that Wicca projects claim pages as their domain. So Wicca Project Sociology actually has a number of pages that they claim as part of sociology. Would that be surprising to you? No, no. They probably should, right? And, and the issue is, if you edit that page, and more of your editing is around pages that are claimed, you're sort of, by your behavior, declaring that you're more affiliated with Wicca Project Sociology than perhaps some other project. So this is a great ecosystem for looking at the membership and co-membership and the distributed membership among these, because of course you know that not everyone only edits one thing if they're real an editor. They're going to edit a few different things. So you kind of saw that in those graphs. So you've got this wonderful way of starting to explore this. So on the design side, we need to build a few things. So one of the things that we're working in, working on is actually making our Reflex toolbar a pluggable tool so that you could take different visualizations that you might want and plug them in. And that's kind of interesting because that means we could potentially collaborate with people who have cool um, plugins that they want to visualize over the top of an active Wikipedia page. So we're working on that. And we're working on uh, simple tools that are Wikipedia-specific um, uh, qualitative coding. So we have this little tool that we're working with this summer called Indicoder that allows you to annotate Wikipedia pages. And this is kind of nice because you know that Wikipedia pages change. They have multiple versions and they change over time. So some behavior, something that you qualitatively code in one page, it may not be there in the next version. Or it may or may not have been there in prior versions. And you might want to track that. So special tools to think about how you qualitatively code these kinds of systems are an important piece of this. So this is one of the things that we're doing on the design side. And then I'll just kind of give you a quick view of what the reflex redesign is. It's going to be moving to the top of the page. We're going to have this kind of ribbony look. How many of you love ribbons? No? Oh, OK, good. All right, some people love ribbons, but you know, well, we'll try that. And, um, and you can select different plugin types. And as you add plugin types, the toolbar adjusts to show the different amount of these different tools. Settings that are part of a tool that are hidden, you can show. Um, when you turn on a tool, then you know, stuff. So there's, there's the control part of the UI, and then there's the visualization part of the UI. So we're going to try and keep those things separate. So all the controls are kind of in one place. And of course, if you go to a regular page, you're still going to get the kinds of um, radial or um, sunburst graphs that we have, as well as top editors. So with that, I'm going to say thank you, um, acknowledge support from the NSF, and all the students who've worked with us. Uh, Michael is currently working with us. Stephanie moved to um, Cornell. Uh, Dylan's an undergraduate. Scott's an undergraduate. Casey's an undergraduate. Chang is an undergraduate. Alina. Uh, was an undergraduate, went to a, our master's program, and then Seaway is an undergraduate. So a lot of undergraduates worked on our project, um, Wikimedia Foundation. And if you'd like to try it now, it's open. I'll leave it up, proxy open for, for the week so you can like inspect your favorite Wikipedia pages. And I'm op open for questions. So you
haven't really been so so far. It's you're <coughs> testing it primarily internally. Yeah. Do you have enough like people just using it e even internally to have some idea about you know what what they're using the most, what visualizations they're using the most, and that sort of thing? So no. And, and one of the things that's interesting about this is we did go to Wikimedia Foundation to show the tool. They were really interested. They really like it. But also, you can kind of tell from the tool, it is not really meant to be like an absolutely everyday user's tool. There's sort of, you kind of have to understand a little bit about Wikipedia, how it works, right? It's more a tool for someone who's a sort of really into the community and, un and understand. So we're, they're more interested in sort of from the groups in Wikimedia Foundation that are sort of interested in the community management pieces. They're actually very interested in that. And the one that was funny is I did a fuller demo of the RFA for them and it was an RFA that was ongoing at the time. And I said, well, you know, this is very interesting. I, I looked at this user X and then I kind of chased it around. And one of the things that you see here is, if you look at this, there's this very interesting hole around this guy. You can come to understand this guy is like, he's sort of like leading this oppose. And of course, there's a lot of people here and they, and they go, yep, yeah, he is. That's the guy. Totally, you totally saw that. It's right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you start to see them. You know, even in the very simplistic views of the network, you can kind of, kind of chase it through and just kind of browse and go, oh wait, there's something going on here. This oppose isn't completely right. Uh, a groundswell. It's more astroturf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. One of the charges you hear about Wikipedia is that it's sort of an in-crowd that does all of the writing. And thinking about Nasha's talk and the idea that if you're connecting with people who are really different from you, then you might have more fruitful things. I'm wondering if the kind of approach, um, if social translucence has anything to offer in terms of, it sounds like you're working from within the community who is best equipped to rise up to higher slots. I'm wondering, does it speak at all? Are there ways in which it can speak to questions of how might people from outside the community be brought in? So, I, I mean, just off the top of my head, I don't know exactly how I would frame it as a, how it could address the issue of bringing people from outside in. I'm not, I, I haven't really thought that much about that problem. I think it does allow people to inspect activity or make it, make it more accessible to inspect these kinds of activities. And that's important to the community because the community claims that when someone goes up for RFA, anyone in the community can have an opinion. And it, while it's not a, a completely like vote system, it really is the case that sort of majority kind of rules. And so if you make it easier to participate, maybe that would allow people to participate more, right? Because you don't have to do all of those individual edits. You can kind of get a picture. So that might be a way of talking about it, but I haven't really pushed that too hard. Just, just to answer, I like that comment because it, by putting the most frequent editors there, you're stimulating the centrality of the, the, the main community. But if you put most recent editors or newcomers who started editing, you would encourage the arrival of newcomers because they would instantly get visibility. So one of the features in this, in the new version, is that top editors is going to become like a plug-in tool and we have what are the hot pages. What are the new editors? So in essence, there will be multiple ways of having that kind of thing as like a tool that you can but pick as the entry point. Her right? point just to support that Jenny and I argue is that the design features encourage people to move from readers to contributors to collaborators to readers right. based on what you think of the design. Right, so, so in this case, what we would try and do is help uh, allow people to kind of pick which ways they would like to see it, right? Yeah. Give them the control yeah. to see it that yeah. way, and that way then, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, There was another, yeah, in the back. So I have a host of tedious technical questions that I'd love to <laughs> chat with you about over the uh, copyright thing, and graph databases, hashing, tool servers, you name it. Oh, uh, God, yeah. It. But uh, for, for this, I'm more interested in, um, when you first introduced how you're going to go one way, which was I'm going to show where on the page this person has edited. And then you went instead the other way, which is I'm going to show you where else they have edited. <coughs> to me, part of this as social translucence is you're trying to lay bare the content, not lay bare the social structure behind the content. So why the design choice to go to the social structure rather than 
look at all the things that this person has done. This is actually produced by humans and not by, uh, you know, well, actually some of it's by bots, but, you know, by some sort of ethereal force out there that's completely inaccessible. So, so oh. yes, we have both the r relational aspects around this page, and then we have the editing aspects of this person, um, of which this page actually it's possible that they're not. I mean, if they show up in the, the, the top bar, obviously they've been editing on this page. But if you chase things down, it's entirely possible that they wouldn't actually have edited this page. I mean, just if you cascade right, following an individual, right? And so, so, so the issue is I think we are showing many of the things that are happening on this page, but around a particular person. And that actually was motivated by some of the early study we did around, well, let me go back to this problem, which is who do they hang out with? That was the main question posed to us by users when we did our RFA study. And so we were actually trying to help the RFA process because actually the RFA process is considered one of the most um, broken processes in Wikipedia. Despite the rapid scaling of participation in Wikipedia, the, the scale of admins was just, it was just like flat. And there are people who have been de, there are actually almost more de admin people who have been removed from admin than have gained admin in, like, say, like the last five years. It's really close. So, so this is one of those processes in Wikipedia that Wikipedia is very interested in fixing. Um, and potentially having more people participate in at least doing the review. So potentially more people saying, you know, this guy seems like he's done a reasonable job. I don't understand why we're not going to support him being an admin. Maybe we can get that. So, so, so the main reason about the things that we picked as the principal visualizations were to support this type of scenario. It turns out that it also happened to help support some of that style, in, style type of scenario. And there are a few others. But in the redesign, we've actually been talking about, well, well, so what are some of the other viz that we might pick? And some of those vizs are not anchored on a person's name, but they would be anchored on a page. So you could imagine anchoring to the page who are the people who have really edited this page in some way, right? Or something about them. So that might be a larger network graph about the people for this page. But yeah, there's also this idea of where has this person edited on this page? And we hadn't done that one because there's a whole set of tools that had already been built in the area of, of um, validating content, trustable content in Wikipedia that actually does that. So that's actually already been done. I, so that's another reason why we didn't do that. But it doesn't mean it's not a good thing to show because those tools aren't actually available. I know where to get those tools, but most Wikipedians can't get those tools. So there's this, Great. yeah, there's this really interesting piece there. Yeah. But this is a question, actually, I'm sort of asking Notch and you at the same time, because you both talked about visual, making things visible and, and making things transparent, making things uh, available to people. And partially Wikipedia works because people can't see who's doing what's on a given page, and so people are willing to try things. That, that's one argument as to what works. And partially scientific stuff works is because you can't find the most prominent person and have everybody in the whole world ask them 19 questions because they get overwhelmed. And so there's, it's, it's not inherently the case that visual translucent and visibility is always good. Um, do you have any feeling for where the traps are with visibility and translucence that we need to watch out for? Yeah. So, so I'll comment first and then I'll give Nash a chance. So, First, um, I, ta I, I know Tom Erickson really well, and he and I have gone a few rounds on this, and uh, I'll support him that you should not confuse translucence with transparency. These two things are really shouldn't be confused. Social translucence is really different. Transparency, the idea that you can really see everything that's going on completely, somehow that's kind of that's creepy, right, potentially. And so, so I think there's, uh, if translucence is done well, it's, it's not truly completely this idea of visible, but interpretable, right? That a person can sit there. And then when you think about that and move translucence kind of p further down that logical conclusion, the, the one thing that I would say is there's kind of like this weird problem of the way translucence sort of plays out. And I've taken heat on this from Tom. So he really thinks that everyone should see exactly the same thing. And that's his view of translucence. And what I would say right now, and we can test this right now, is are you seeing the same thing I am even though we're in the same social setting? No. 
So, so there's this weird tension around social translucence that suggests that if you're doing translucence well, maybe we don't have to see exactly the same thing. We might come to similar interpretations of what's going on here, but we don't necessarily see exactly the same thing. And that carries through. I mean, there's lots of systems that have regular user roles and admin roles. And what an admin sees is clear about the system is clearly different than what users see. And I, I don't think we ever would break that down. So there's something going on in the space. And that's the, my long-winded claim of saying there's something about translucence that the current res representation of the theory and the current way we think about it as a design idea sort of doesn't quite account for. And so it needs some work. There's work to be done there. So I think that that's, that's, that's a fair enough question. I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm not familiar with translucence on, 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 on the not level you are, certainly. Uh, but I would argue that, uh, Brian, you're starting from the premise that we are trying something new. When if you, if you rewind a little bit, you know, there was more translucence or transparency when we didn't have a virtual. When everyone was face to face, people knew who was, who was friends with whom. David Cracker, for example, has this very interesting concept in networks called mm -hmm. cognitive social structures. It's who knows who knows who, right? So it's our mental map of who is connected to who. So there is an actual network of who's connected, and then there's a, a perception of who's connected to who. And when we are in face-to-face -face settings, we have a pretty good idea of who's connected to who, for the most part, because especially in the work settings, because we see who hangs out with whom at lunch, who is at a water cooler with whom, when we walk by people's offices or cubicles, we see who is hanging out with whom, et cetera. When we went virtual, we lost that. So part of what this is doing is using the same technology that shrouded those kinds of uh, perceptions. Uh, now I'm trying to now unshroud it, if that's the word. And I was trying to, again, bring back, bring that back. So it's not like we are experimenting for the first time. Yes, in that stage, before we had virtual technologies, transparency was good and bad. You know, that's why in cognitive social structures, one of the ways in which I talk about it is that one of the ways in which you can decide whether a link exists is by asking the two people. But then there is the uh, Brad, what is it, the Brad Pitt and Delina story, where if you ask the two people whether they were having an affair, they would say no at one time, right? And everyone else would say yes. So what makes it yes is not if anyone else, if, they, if the two of them said it, it's what everyone else said, which is what part the social structure is. So of course it could be bad for them at the time, right? They didn't like all this transparency. It's driving them crazy. So that can be true in science as well. It is true in science. But I think the problem is not a new problem. That problem was there in face to face, and now we, we may we see the recurrence of the problem as we increase translucence slash transparency or more transparency in the virtual world as well. Sure. Uh, on the same question, uh, one of the main contributions here is to raise visibility and to show things to humans who then can make decisions. Have you have you done any work to kind of take it to where the computer, you know, might induce some sort of model that could help make decisions, maybe even to, for instance, in this case, to nominate someone who might be a good admin based on their similarity or or any other patterns that could be observed? So um, actually, th that's that's almost explicitly what this work does: mapping up modeling Wikipedia promotion decision making. So so it, they actually have this. So th what I would say is, and this. So uh, first off, I, I, I like Mora. It's great work. <laughs> Bob Kraut, I, I, complete admiration. They are quintessential statisticians. They know how to do that well. And so this paper does a really good job outlining all of these really interesting qualitative traits that are really important to do adminship decision making well. And then they go, oh, we throw all those out because these things are countable. So there's a great statistical model. It is really good. I mean, and it's accurate. I mean, I, I tell students, I had another student that was working on something similar. I said, you should just adopt that model. It's a reasonable model to start with. But recognize that there's this whole space here of things that they acknowledge, but you, they can't count. So, so that's one thing, is that there's, there's a weird thing about thinking about the statistics. And, and so in terms of like helping people, there's some other work that I've done um, on um, Wikipedia vandalism. And one of the things that's interesting about vandalism is it's it actually it takes a little work to detect vandalism well when it's subtle. And people are actually bad at this. And something that people are actually bad at when it's subtle, machines are going to be pretty horrible at. And so the student that I was working with, the argument I was making with her and that I was trying to get her to kind of push more forcefully is that 
automatic vandal detection, that modeling, that's going to cover a really interesting, say, like 90% of stuff that you just, you get it right. And then there's this really interesting 10% of stuff that if you know that the model has a horrible time with it, then that tells people where, they're, where person attention may be most valuable. And so I think there's really some interesting spaces here where maybe we can do some really cool things, but then if we can recognize where we have trouble, we can actually leverage the power of the crowd even more, right? Because attention is a limited resource. And so we should, we should value it. It's, it's the systems that aren't evaluate, valuing of the person's attention that maybe are the ones we should be trying to squelch. But these ones that are valuing the attention, that are, they're saying, you know, this is a difficult problem and I really need help with it, right? Because the machine can't do it. That could, that's a huge value, potential, yeah. I wanted to open up the um, trans uh, translucence and transparency discussion a little bit more because my understanding or, or certainly my interpretation of the Ericsson and Kellogg work was that what they, they showed a, a circle of participation in a track and chat system and what and in some of that I think that translucence actually was the same as transparency and one of the things I wanted to mention particularly was that people who were lurking on that system, or people who were, I prefer the term not participating, were shown up. And at that time, it was thought to be a sort of pejorative activity. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to sort of point that out and open that out. And then following on from that, I wondered if there were how much controversy there is about the translucence that your systems are operating. I have to say that unlike Ben, if I was a new person coming in, I don't want to be shown up. I want to get to use the system and build up my competence first. Yeah. So, you know, in a way, it's revealing some things that people might prefer not to be revealed for good reasons. For yeah. Yeah. So just to just to kind of um, sort of reiterate the sh the issue that um, Jenny was mentioning is that their original visualization was basically like this one in the middle here uh, that they called the cookie. And, um, and it represented a chat room. And um, when people were contributing to the chat, they were colored in and they would come to the middle. They would like, like, like that we were kind of joining up to have this kind of close intimate conversation. So they would come to the middle. And when they were not typing into the chat, when they were not sort of participating in the chat, they'd actually hang out on the edges. And so lurking was someone who was signed in and just sitting on the edge, right? That, so that's how you would interpret lurking. So, so they would claim, so again, I'll, I'll channel Tom. <laughs> they would claim, this isn't transparency. It's not transparency because I'm not telling you actually in the context of, of this what they're actually saying and who they're actually speaking to, right? So there's a certain thing here that, that is not quite transparent, that's not that's not completely exposed. But it exposed. shows if they're not speaking. That's a bit. Well, right. So, right. I, so I'm just, I'm just kind of. Like, <laughs> I can't completely support everything they say. Come on. <laughs> they are unique. <laughs> I am not them. Right. Um, and so, so I'm just kind of saying that that's sort of the line of argumentation that they make about why it's actually translucence and not transparency. But right. So, so tra translucence is gonna reveal some things. That in, in the past had, had, you had, would have needed to kind of scope out a little bit more. So in IRC, if you watch enough of IRC, you can figure out who has not said anything in the last few hours, right? It's very hard to be completely hidden on IRC because you can see the names. So it's not that that wasn't available, right? You can see who's lurking, but it takes more work. Right, because that interpretation and the work to do that interpretation, the system's not helping you do any of that interpretation, right? And so their system is making a little bit more of that that interpretation easier to make. Okay, so that's that's the first thing about the nature of translucence versus transparency, and you can tell there's certainly there's kind of a line here, it's a thin, potentially thin line, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then about the kinds of systems that we have. So yeah, you know. It's kind of interesting, you know, when we did the talk at Wikimedia Foundation, there was a, a few people out there that were like, you should never release this. Wikipedians are gonna hate this. Mm -hmm. Because there are some that 
don't want their behaviors inspected so easily. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the other half of the room crops up and goes, yeah, but they're just troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> so even inside, yeah. right, you can tell that inside there's like these kinds of debates. Mm -hmm. You know, is lurking good or bad? Are these people who would be so, feel somewhat violated, because remember, the edit history is all there to inspect. It's just that the tool makes it easier to inspect, right? So it's not that you can't see these people's behavior and the really good Wikipedians know how to find that person's yeah. behavior. It's that you're making it available to sort of the, the broad, unwashed masses that now can see that maybe I'm not completely the honorable admin. Maybe I'm an admin that takes a few too liberties, right? Or, or whatever. I mean, yeah, that, those things become more visible by, by lots of people. Yeah. And, and that's not, that, that translucence or heading toward transparency, not every system wants all of it, right? So, so I think there's, there is something there, yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, I don't have a way of gauging whether that's sort of the traditional resistance to, to new features or new systems or not. I don't have a way of completely thinking about that. But, but when you think about systems that compile massive amounts of behavioral data, it's going to become easier and easier to do this. So I think in the space of, of the complex systems that we're going to be building, this, whether it's just resistance to a new feature or whether it's the new domain of the kinds of things we're going to allow people to see in online, I think there's something going to be going on there and it's good for us to stay on top of it thinking about it rather than let, I don't know, Google do it or let uh, Facebook do it, or, right? Yeah, where we don't have an idea of what, what's really going on. There's actually, okay, yeah. But it seems like there's kind of a conflict between what you just said and a point you made earlier where the people who are kind of generalists to Wikipedia aren't the ones who are necessarily interested in the information you're providing. So how do you necessarily gauge between the work that you're doing as valuable, per se, and kind right. of this ethnographic attempt to inform the community itself and gauge what they're interested in? Right. So, so it's not completely inconsistent because what it was designed for doesn't necessarily mar align with like who might actually uptake it and why it might be taken up. Okay, so those aren't inconsistent. It was designed for the RFA process and the way in which people engage the RFA process. And by and large, the people who participate in the RFA chat discussions, they're generally very experienced Wikipedians. I don't have to tell them about namespaces. Right? They, they know it. Matter of fact, they would complain that I called it a context, right? They would say, no, those are namespaces. You should use namespaces, right? And that, that, that kind of experience user. But these tools, because they make, potentially, and again, that's the issue, potentially, they make something that's very difficult to do as an experienced Wikipedian. You kind of need to know how to churn through all of these edit histories of all of these people. They make something that's difficult to do that maybe now only experts are doing it, because that's what we're seeing, experts are doing it. They make it potentially that a person that isn't quite as expert, that makes it possible for them to do it. Now, do they or will they? I don't have the data for that yet. I mean, I just, I just don't, right? We haven't opened it up. And so, so I don't know if that will happen. But, but that is what I'm, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the potential because it, it does open up something that's difficult and make that difficult thing a little easier. So potentially a less experienced person could pick it up, but it wasn't designed for them. You're absolutely right. Yeah. A really wonderful discussion. Oh, thank, thank you very much.